This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox dot org. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Book One, translated by Eilmer and Louise Maud. Chapter Twenty Three. Pierre well knew this large room divided by columns and an arch, its walls hung round with Persian carpets. The part of the room behind the columns, with a high silk-curtained mahogany bedstead on one side, and on the other an immense case containing icons, was brightly illuminated with red light like a Russian church during evening service. Under the gleaming icons, stood a long invalid chair, and in that chair, on snowy white smooth pillows, evidently freshly changed, Pierre saw, covered to the waist by a bright green quilt, the familiar majestic figure of his father, Count Bezukhov, with that grey mane of hair above his broad forehead, which reminded one of a lion and the deep characteristically noble wrinkles of his handsome ruddy face. He lay just under the icons, his large thick hands outside the quilt. Into the right hand, which was lying palm downwards, a wax taper had been thrust between forefinger and thumb, and an old servant, bending over from behind the chair, held it in position. By the chair stood the priests, their long hair falling over their magnificent glittering vestments, with lighted tapers in their hands, slowly and solemnly conducting the service. A little behind them stood the two younger princesses, holding handkerchiefs to their eyes, and just in front of them their eldest sister, Katish, with a vicious and determined look steadily fixed on the icons, as though declaring to all that she could not answer for herself, should she glance round. Anna Mikhailovna, with a meek, sorrowful, and all-forgiving expression on her face, stood by the door near the strange lady. Prince Vasily, in front of the door, near the invalid chair, a wax taper in his left hand, was leaning his left arm on the carved back of a velvet chair, he had turned round for the purpose, and was crossing himself with his right hand, turning his eyes upward each time he touched his forehead. His face wore a calm look of piety and resignation to the will of God. If you do not understand these sentiments, he seemed to be saying, so much the worse for you. Behind him stood the aide-de-camp, the doctors and the men-servants. The men and women had separated, as in church. All were silently crossing themselves, and the reading of the church service, the subdued chanting of deep bass voices, and in the intervals sighs and the shuffling of feet were the only sounds that could be heard. Anna Mikhailovna, with an air of importance that showed that she felt she quite knew what she was about, went across the room to where Pierre was standing, and gave him a taper. He lit it, and, distracted by observing those around him, began crossing himself with the hand that held the taper. Sophie, the rosy, laughter-loving, youngest princess with the mole, watched him. She smiled, hid her face in her handkerchief, and remained with it hidden for a while. Then, looking up and seeing Pierre, she again began to laugh. She evidently felt unable to look at him without laughing, but could not resist looking at him. So, to be out of temptation, she slipped quietly behind one of the columns. In the midst of the service, the voices of the priests suddenly ceased. They whispered to one another, 
and the old servant who was holding the Count's hand got up and said something to the ladies. Anna Mikhailovna stepped forward and, stooping over the dying man, beckoned to Lorraine from behind her back. The French doctor held no taper. He was leaning against one of the columns in a respectful attitude, implying that he, a foreigner, in spite of all differences of faith, understood the full importance of the rite now being performed, and even approved of it. He now approached the sick man with the noiseless step of one in full vigor of life, with his delicate white fingers raised from the quilt the hand that was free, and turning sideways, felt the pulse and reflected a moment. The sick man was given something to drink. There was a stir around him. Then the people resumed their places, and the service continued. During this interval, Pierre noticed that Prince Vasily left the chair on which he had been leaning, and, with air which intimated that he knew what he was about, and if others did not understand him, it was so much the worse for them, did not go up to the dying man, but passed by him, joined the eldest princess, and moved with her to the side of the room where stood the high bedstead with its silken hangings. On leaving the bed, both Prince Vasily and the princess passed out by a back door, but returned to their places one after the other before the service was concluded. Pierre paid no more attention to this occurrence than to the rest of what went on, having made up his mind once and for all that what he saw happening around him that evening was, in some way, essential. The chanting of the service ceased, and the voice of the priest was heard respectfully congratulating the dying man on having received the sacrament. The dying man lay as lifeless and immovable as before. Around him every one began to stir. Steps were audible, and whispers, among which Anna Mikhailovna's was the most distinct. Pierre heard her say, Certainly he must be moved on to the bed. Here it will be impossible. The sick man was so surrounded by doctors, princesses, and servants, that Pierre could no longer see the reddish-yellow face with its grey mane, which, though he saw other faces as well, he had not lost sight of for a single moment during the whole service. He judged by the cautious movements of those who crowded round the invalid chair that they had lifted the dying man and were moving him. "'Catch hold of my arm, or you'll drop him!' he heard one of the servants say, in a frightened whisper. "'Catch hold from underneath! Here!' exclaimed different voices, and the heavy breathing of the bearers and the shuffling of their feet grew more hurried, as if the weight they were carrying were too much for them. As the bearers, among them who was Anna Mikhailovna, passed the young man, he caught a momentary glimpse between their heads and backs of the dying man's high, stout, uncovered chest and powerful shoulders, raised by those who were holding him under the armpits, and of his grey, curly, leonin head. This head, with its remarkably broad brow and cheekbones, its handsome, sensual mouth, and its cold, majestic expression, was not disfigured by the approach of death. It was the same as Pierre remembered it three months before, when the Count had sent him to Petersburg. But now this head was swaying helplessly with the uneven movements of the bearers, and the cold, listless gaze fixed itself upon nothing. After a few minutes' bustle beside the high bedstead, those who had carried the sick man disappeared. Anna Mikhailovna touched Pierre's hand and said, Come. Pierre went with her to the bed on which the sick man had been laid in a stately pose in keeping with the ceremony just completed. 
He lay with his head propped high on the pillows. His hands were symmetrically placed on the green silk quilt, the palms downward. When Pierre came up, the Count was gazing straight at him, but with a look the significance of which could not be understood by mortal man. Even if this look meant nothing but that as long as one has eyes they must look somewhere, or it meant too much. Pierre hesitated, not knowing what to do, and glanced inquiringly at his guide. Anna Mikhailovna made a hurried sign with her eyes, glancing at the sick man's head, and moving her lips as if to send it a kiss. Pierre, carefully stretching his neck so as not to touch the quilt, followed her suggestion, and pressed his lips to the large, boned, fleshy hand. Neither the hand nor a single muscle of the Count's face stirred. Once more, Pierre looked questioningly at Anna Mikhailovna, to see what he was to do next. Anna Mikhailovna, with her eyes, indicated a chair that stood beside the bed. Pierre obediently sat down, his eyes asking if he were doing right. Anna Mikhailovna nodded approvingly. Again, Pierre fell into the naively symmetrical pose of an Egyptian statue, evidently distressed that his stout and clumsy body took up so much room, and doing his utmost to look as small as possible. He looked at the Count, who still gazed at the spot where Pierre's face had been before he sat down. Anna Mikhailovna indicated by her attitude her consciousness of the pathetic importance of these last moments of meeting between father and son. This lasted about two minutes, which to Pierre seemed an hour. Suddenly the broad muscles and lines of the Count's face began to twitch. The twitching increased. The handsome mouth was drawn to one side. Only now did Pierre realize how near death his father was and from that distorted mouth issued an indistinct hoarse sound. Anna Mikhailovna looked attentively at the sick man's eyes, trying to guess what he wanted. She pointed first to Pierre, then to some drink, then named Prince Vasily in an inquiring whisper, then pointed to the quilt. The eyes and face of the sick man showed impatience. He made an effort to look at the servant who stood constantly at the head of the bed. "'Wants to turn to the other side,' whispered the servant, and got up to turn the Count's heavy body toward the wall. Pierre rose to help him. While the Count was being turned over, one of his arms fell back helplessly, and he made a fruitless effort to pull it forward. Whether he noticed the look of terror with which Pierre regarded that lifeless arm, or whether some other thought flitted across his dying brain, at any rate he glanced at the refractory arm, at Pierre's terror-stricken face, and again at the arm, and on his face a feeble, piteous smile appeared, quite out of keeping with his features, that seemed to deride his own helplessness. At sight of this smile, Pierre felt an unexpected quivering in his breast, and a tickling in his nose, and tears dimmed his eyes. The sick man was turned on to his side, with his face to the wall. He sighed. He is dozing, said Anna Mikhailovna, observing that one of the princesses was coming to take her turn at watching. Let us go. Pierre went out. End of chapter 23 from book one of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy 
read by Dennis Sayers, in Modesto, California, for LibriVox, Fall 2006.